As heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is a Dark Archives episode of Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com, where you can find the daily podcast and all social media that I'm on, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and others, along with the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into this Dark Archives episode of Weird Darkness. I was sleeping peacefully when I was awakened by what felt like two hands gripping my ankles and pressing them down onto the bed so that I was unable to move my feet. Thinking I was about to be raped by intruders, I screamed and yelled while trying to kick my feet, but I could barely move. In a panic, I started swinging my fists through the air and struck nothing. As my eyes adjusted to the morning light in the room, I paused to catch my breath and glanced quickly around the room. There was no one there. I could still feel the tight grip on my ankles, and I tried to move my feet but still couldn't. I took a deep breath and screamed my son's name as I threw my pillow at the nothing that had a grip on me. My son burst into my room. What? Mom, what's the matter? I said something had a hold of my ankles and held me down. He said, I've been up for an hour. There's nobody here, Mom. You were dreaming. I said, didn't you hear me yelling and screaming? Our apartment is small. You could hear a whisper from one end to the other. But he replied, I heard you call my name just now. There's nobody here, Mom. It's all right. You were dreaming. There was no convincing him. I know logic is working against me, but I wasn't dreaming. I was wide awake, fighting and yelling. I felt the hands. I couldn't move. I was awake and there was no one there. My ankles hurt. The next day I had bruises. It was explained away that maybe I bruised myself from kicking my feet. But that's not what happened at all. This incident happened in 2009 in Odessa, Texas. I was living in an apartment with my boyfriend, Artie, and a dog. One night I was home alone with the dog. As I was ready to fall asleep, the dog already under the covers, I heard a man's voice say, Hey, lady, in a very distinct, gruff voice, like a heavy smoker. The dog reacted right away, barking. Just then I heard Artie coming into the house. We talked about what happened, calmed the dog down, and went to sleep. The next day I mentioned the incident to a couple of neighbors. One man told me that a few years before, a man had committed suicide in my apartment. He blew his brains out in my bedroom. The neighbor knew him. When I asked him what kind of voice his friend had, he told me that he had a deep voice and he was a heavy smoker. His name was Eddie Mack. Fast forward to 2015. I met a man through a personals column. 
I was telling him about my experience when I mentioned Eddie Mack's name. He told me that he knew him. He was a cop in the town where he'd grown up and that he'd lost his job. My friend knew that he'd blown his brains out but didn't realize he was in Texas. Ever since I qualified as a teacher, I have had some very interesting paranormal experiences inside school buildings. One building was reputed to be haunted by quite a few ghosts, and there were a lot of cold spots, especially in the gym where a murder was said to have taken place. However, the story I am submitting today is rather strange. In this particular school, we usually had 20 to 30 students per class. My classroom that day was quite spacious for us, and on my left were the door and narrow window. I had a few jokers in this class that day that kept on annoying each other, so while I was writing on the board, I was keeping an eye on their reflections too. At first, I was staring straight at them, and then suddenly something caught my eye. Outside the window, a boy around 10 years old passed. I only saw his head but wasn't able to see his facial features properly. I stared at him because I thought that he's the son of one of my colleagues who sometimes allowed him to accompany her to work. Suddenly, he disappeared before reaching the door. I immediately excused myself from the class and went out to check if I'm just imagining that the boy disappeared. I looked around the corridor, but there was nobody there. Then it hit me that there's only one class in that area except mine. I went to the other classroom to ask if they saw a boy running around and check if there's someone around that height. When I arrived there, they said that they hadn't seen anyone since the bell rang. I shrugged it off and went back to my class. After that class had ended, I'd almost forgotten about the incident. I went to my second class. My second classroom is located in the fourth floor of the main building. Visitors on that floor can feel a very heavy and suffocating feeling. They don't turn on the lights in that area, and there are minimal windows, which makes it scarier. There is one room on that floor that always catches my attention. I don't know why, but every time I pass there, I feel like someone is sitting by the door staring at me as I pass by. The classroom I was using on that floor is very comfortable and bright. I had a class of around 25 there. After finishing my lesson, we had a very fun conversation. Suddenly, they became quiet, and that's when I heard a small child singing. It sounded like a girl. I asked my students if they heard it, but everyone said they didn't. Again, curiosity got the best of me, so I went out to check, but all I saw was the darkness of the hallway. There was simply nobody there to be seen. years ago, I was at a friend's house with a few other buddies. At around 4 in the morning, we decided to go to bed and get some sleep. I was in the Brewster's Projects in Detroit. Don't know if it has to do with anything, but the building is probably around 70 or 80 years old. Anyway, we're all in the same room trying to get some sleep. Everything seemed fine. The Brewster Projects were considered to be one of the most dangerous places in Detroit but nothing ever happened to me when I was there visiting friends. As I was drifting off, I felt something tapping me. I ignored it, I just thought it was one of my friends trying to bother me. Awake and getting pissed off at this point, I sat up in bed and tried to catch one of them in the act. 
Soon after the tap, I saw a hand emerge out from under the bed and tap my leg. I mean, this is an actual hand, with fingernails and everything. It looked completely real. I watched as it receded back under the bed. I looked under the bed expecting to see one of my friends. Nothing. There was nothing at all under the bed. I still thought they were pulling a prank on me. This is when stuff gets really strange. A sheet on the bed shoots up in the air. Everyone in the room saw it. A little scared now, we tried to turn on the light, which wouldn't turn on. Another friend tried to pick the phone up in the hall. He said the phone felt like it was burning through his hand. He actually let out a scream. Then the mattress I was sleeping on started to push up as if someone was under the bed, followed by the sound of clanking pipes. I jumped off the bed and all of us were confused and didn't know what to do. Then violent knocking came from closet and bedroom doors. Trapped, we started to panic, even more so when a dog toy flew across the room. I turned my back to make for the door when I felt a hard scratch on my back. We ran to the kitchen to get out of the room. Only moments after reaching the kitchen, a plate was knocked off of a surface. We returned to the room only to be harassed by the clanking until sunrise. I suspect the entity to be a poltergeist, but I know that they're not known to materialize, so I don't know any explanation for the hand. Has anyone else had any weird experiences at the Brewster's Projects in Detroit? In 2012, I was staying with my brother in Winchington, Massachusetts, a very small town with winding streets. He lived in a wooded area with houses far apart. One very early morning, I received a phone call from a friend. He was driving through town on his way to a job. We agreed to meet in the yard. We were on our cell phones, I was directing him to the house and walking towards the street. I reached the end of the driveway and stopped short. There was a pickup truck parked on the side of the street. It scared me because it didn't belong. I thought there was someone in it and felt threatened. I told my friend on the phone that I was walking back to the house. He immediately drove up. He never saw the truck. I was so close to it, I could have reached out and touched it. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com.
first day I moved into my new house was amazing. I had been living with my parents, and I had never felt better than I did to move into my own place. After the house movers had left, I had some washing up to do. While doing that chore, I heard footsteps from the hallway. These steps went halfway up the stairs and stopped. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand to attention. I felt this sudden feeling of dread, and it was really uncomfortable. I checked all four bedrooms and found nothing. The house was silent, but I still had this feeling of dread. I carried on with the washing up, trying to forget about it, and about a half hour later, I mean, I now owned a house, right? What could be more exciting than that? Two months later, I had started getting used to the feeling of dread. I was lying on my bed with my partner. She used to stay over quite often. We were lying on my bed, snuggled together. She looked up and suddenly started shaking, staring at the ceiling. When I asked her what was wrong, she said she saw some kind of smoke appear in the corner of the ceiling and then a face appeared through the ceiling staring at her for a few seconds before vanishing. When I saw her face, it had gone completely white. That same feeling of dread came over me like when I heard the footsteps. This feeling of dread seemed more intense. I couldn't relax at all. My partner left soon after. I came downstairs one morning for breakfast and saw a small boy in my kitchen. This little boy was wearing dirty black shoes, gray knee-length socks that were down by his ankles in a way that looked scruffy, a pair of dirty black shorts, a gray t-shirt, and a gray scruffy cap, and the boy was very thin. My partner, who was staying over again, said she had seen him too. We started to talk about what was happening, and she said she had seen other things while staying over and asked if I had seen anything else. I told her I hadn't, but I did explain the feeling of dread to her and I told her about the footsteps. She mentioned that soon after I'd moved in, she'd gone for a cigarette by the open kitchen door which led to the garage. After about a minute, she felt someone grip her shoulder, but when she turned, there was no one there as we were all in the front room. She said she always felt like someone was staring at her in the house. After our conversation, the male presence became much stronger. It was almost as though it now knew that we had noticed it. During the day, the house was filled with more dread. Even if the sun was shining outside, the house would be dark. It was almost as though the presence in that house was blocking out the sunlight. On the hottest day of the year, I had to have the lights on downstairs in order to read a book. At night, I kept the door to my room closed, and I could feel this male presence angrily walking around the house, especially walking past my room. I could feel him stopping outside my room and staring at me, as if the door wasn't there, as if he knew exactly where my head was and where I was sitting. This happened every night. Some nights, this male would spend the entire night just staring at me through the door. Those were the times I'd have an early night and want to go to sleep as fast as possible. When my partner stayed over, she'd go downstairs during the night to use the toilet and find the living room and kitchen lights on, knowing that all lights had been turned off before we'd gone to bed. Sometimes just the kitchen light or the back room light or the front room light would be on. One time, the kitchen lights came on by themselves as she walked to the light switch to switch it on. Another time, she went downstairs to the toilet and she screamed. I ran downstairs to find her sitting on the bottom step. She told me she opened the door to see the kitchen light flickering on and off with a huge black shape in the middle. I went to check it out and found the light on, but no dark shape. That male presence in the house didn't like me at all. I felt that this spirit was unable to approach me, but found some pleasure in wearing me down physically. For what purpose? I don't know. I've never gone back to that house. I just feel bad for that little boy. 
Soon after the toilet incident, I moved to another house with my partner, and we don't intend to go back. This experience happened a good year ago. This takes place in Ireland. Me and my mates were out in the pub, and one of my friends asked if one of us could take him home. We laughed and told him that he could get himself home. He said it was a long walk and he wanted some company. In the end, I had to. If only we knew why he was scared. We went past the roads and town until we reached the countryside not too far from the pub. We reached his house and walked past the porch and into the hallway. My friend told me a man would sometimes visit him in his sleep. I didn't believe it and told him it was bull. I thought he was trying to scare me along with the old look of the house. But before I left, I heard a scream come from his bedroom. I raced into his room to find him staring at a dark figure sitting on his bed. A man-like figure stared straight at him. As soon as I blinked, he was gone. I never went back there, and my friend sold his house. I was about 10 years old at the time, back in 1983, at my grandma's house. We all lived with my grandma at the time, my uncle, my sister, my mother, and I. It was a weekend evening, and everyone in the house went to a party a family friend was throwing. I was pretty sick, so my mother stayed home that weekend with me. We were staying up really late, watching TV. We were getting really into this film when all the lights in the entire house suddenly went off. The house was pitch black. We couldn't even see our hands in front of our faces. My mom stood up and said, I'll go check the breaker in the kitchen. I'll be right back. She was gone for about 10 minutes at this point, and I was just sitting on the living room couch waiting. I was a little spooked out by the darkness, but confident that the light would come on soon. Then I heard her voice coming from the guest bathroom. Jenny, Jenny, come here. It was my mom's voice in a whisper but I could tell it was just a little different. My blood froze. Jenny, I'm in the bathroom. Come, now! I knew my mom was in the kitchen room, which was way opposite of where this voice said she was. I slowly stood up and found myself making my way to the long hallway, hands in front of me because I could not see a thing. As I slowly walked closer and closer to the guest bathroom, it picked up. I'm in here, the voice said. I was in front of the bathroom door, hand on the knob, ready to find whoever was in there. Then, just like that, all the lights in the house came back on. I quickly ran into my mom's arms and I cried. I didn't tell her what happened until much later on. That was probably the scariest thing that ever happened to me. What was impersonating my mother? This happened last night, but it started a few days ago when my son's friend Facebooked me and asked about a Ouija board they had found in his grandma's attic. She had died and they were cleaning out the house. It was just an A4 size Ouija board on hardboard with a small planchet still in the envelope it came in. I've been into the occult, ghosts, and Ouija boards for many years, and I actually have my own board, so he wanted to know what to do with it. I told him that it would be fine so long as she had opened and closed it down properly if she had used it, and that it wasn't the board that was dangerous, just what comes through when it's used. I told him I would have it if they wanted to get rid of it. He dropped it off a few days ago, and since then, my salt lamp has been flicking on and off. 
I just put it down to the bulb, but then yesterday, my Kindle wouldn't charge. I had to keep moving the wire around. Again, I put it down to my USB port being faulty, not that it had done this before. Later on the next day, I went upstairs to put the washing away in our bedroom and took my Kindle to play music on. A little way into a song, it suddenly stopped. I looked at it, and it hadn't stopped or paused, so I pressed play again. It did it again, a little more into the song, so I pressed play again, thinking it must be faulty. Then the next song did the same. So I said, if this is a spirit, stop the song now. And it did. And so I said, please, stop it, it's annoying. It did it again, once, and that was it. Later on that night, I went to bed. I always sleep on my side. I was at that drifting off, not fully asleep stage when all of a sudden, I can't really explain how or why, but I was on my back and something was on top of me. I couldn't move or speak. I could see it, but not see it. Its hand was gripping my hair at the front, pushing my head down. The only thing I could think to do was say the Lord's Prayer, which was not easy. It took all my strength to say it. Then it was gone. I turned over and chose to ignore it. I wasn't asleep and I wasn't on my back when I turned the light off and it had only been about 15 minutes since the light went off. I don't know if this was real or what's been happening is all coincidence, but my Kindle is working fine today. I'm going to wait and see if anything else happens, then decide what to do. When I was 14, in 1961, my family moved into a new house. On the opposite side of the road to the house stood a church. This church was surrounded by a graveyard on three sides. The church was still used, but the graveyard had no burials carried out since sometime in the 1940s. Some of the graves dated back to the 1800s. The newer part was sort of okay, but the side with the old headstones was very overgrown. A road ran to the front of the church, as did a path. An old wooden fence surrounded the church. This fence was constructed of single slats of wood, which on many occasions, as I walked past the church, I would run my fingers along until I reached the end of the graveyard before crossing the road where I lived. Just before reaching the end, there was a gap in the fence of about 10 feet where the fence was missing. In the middle stood a lamp post, which was the only one within about 200 yards. This lamp post was lit by a single light bulb, similar to one found in a domestic building. Over the years of growing up, my father told me stories, such as the one about someone who was passing the church in the early hours on his way to work. What he saw caused him to run all the way to his workplace where, on his arrival, he was still so shocked that medical staff had to attend to him. He told them that on walking past the graveyard, he caught sight of someone in the old part, which, as I said before, was really overgrown. He saw an old gentleman dressed in what looked like clothes dating back from the 1800s. He was carrying an old lantern and was bent over a grave as if looking at the headstone. Fast forward three years to when I was 17 and had been for a night out with four friends. They lived in the estate behind where my parents' house was. Where I lived stood on a lane in a row of about six to eight houses. We said our good nights and I walked up past the front of the church while they walked in a different direction. As I walked, I ran my fingers along the fence, which was about five feet high. As I reached the end of the fence in the graveyard, I stopped under the lamp near the gap in the fence. I glanced at my watch, which said it was exactly 12 midnight, when all of a sudden there was a very loud scream, sounding much like the scream of a woman, which rooted me to the spot. It was so loud that even my friends, who must have been a hundred yards from where I was standing, heard it, came running to where I stood, 
as did a police constable who lived in the same row of houses as I did. It wasn't just a normal scream. It started and didn't stop. It seemed to start and go on and on, but it was becoming less and less, as if whatever it was was moving away from me. It just went on and on, eventually fading out until it stopped. My friends and I, together with the local Bobby, walked to the back of the graveyard, climbed over the back fence and walked through the overgrown part of the old graveyard and found nothing. Having walked through the graveyard, we eventually arrived at the lamppost where I first heard the scream. One of my friends was so shocked that he stood crying on the path under the lamppost. We stood talking for a while before once again going our own ways. I don't know what the scream was that night. Neither did we find out, but I have never forgotten it. I was 17 years old at that time, and I'm now 69. It was a rickety 1970s era Houston abode with thin walls and peeling paint. I saw it once, maybe twice, in the 1990s visiting my grandfather who still lived there. My mother and her younger brother grew up in the house, who on separate occasions had each been the sole occupant of a particular bedroom. One day, my mom's cat suddenly began paying much too great attention to a corner of the room near the ceiling where the walls meet. The cat eventually began hissing intermittently with its fur standing on end, eyes locked on the corner. Mom, whose attention had been captured by now, watched in awe until the cat suddenly leaped off the bed and clambered underneath it in seemingly fearful flight. This was the case on more than one occasion. My uncle had the same room years later and a dog. As you might have guessed, the dog became entranced by the same damn corner. A steady, low, rumbling growl eventually escaped the dog's throat. Its fur became ruffled in alertness as it let out alarmed barks. My ever-fearless six-foot-tall uncle reached into the corner, his hand meeting an unusually cold sensation near the ceiling. Dog still barking, my uncle sensed something that didn't belong and did the first thing that came to mind. String together a violent stream of curse words and let her rip like only a sailor's mouth such as his could do. Neither animal ever paid attention to the corner again. Whatever it was, it was no longer there. I was ending another long day of construction work with a meal at a Golden Corral Steakhouse in South Florida. As I exited the building, it was already dark and close to 9 p.m. I was approached by a young man, clean, respectful, but who explained that he was down on his luck and living behind the restaurant in a tent and could I give him some money. I said nothing and walked to my truck. My policy was to give nothing to panhandlers. I got in the truck and could plainly see the entire area, but he was gone, vanished. I wonder to this day about that, and my $70,000 a year job is a long lost memory. Thanks for listening to this Dark Archives episode of Weird Darkness. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the contact social page at weirddarkness.com. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, click on Tell Your Story. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. 
Weird Darkness is a copyright and trademark of Marlar House Productions. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marlar. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marlar on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marlar. Hey, weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.